Welcome. It's a lively crowd in July. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, people are afraid of the front row. I don't know why that is. Or there's cushy couches in the back. Maybe that's what it is, but yes. Um, welcome. I know that we have some people who are trickling in. Appreciate you being here in the nice air conditioning. I'm Amy Lillard from Washington Filmworks. And this is, of course, our monthly happy hour event. And um, I don't know if everyone heard outside, but I had such a great pleasure spending an hour and a half with our special guest um, tonight talking about what the vision for KCTS is. Uh, and what it's going to look like reinvented under his leadership. So I'm so very pleased to, uh, to welcome the president and CEO, Rob Dunlop. Thank you very much. Uh, it is wonderful to be here, and it was uh, a terrific social event, great chance to mix with the creative community. We have one of the most vibrant creative communities, I think, anywhere in the country uh, throughout this region. And so we're uh, really excited to have an opportunity to associate with, uh, with all of you. Uh, so I joined KCTS 9 uh, unofficially about two years ago and officially about a year ago. I did an interim assignment for a while. And uh, from the get-go, we really started spending our time thinking about how do we redefine public television? What is happening in the whole media environment around us? And how do we adapt what is a traditional, linear, broadcast television operation uh, to the dynamics of what's going on in the sector around us. So that's a lot of what I want to spend uh, our time this evening talking about sort of where we're headed and what we're thinking about. Um, I do want to begin by thanking those of you who have been viewers and supporters of KCTS. You know, a lot of our support as a public media entity comes from individuals and comes from corporations and uh, folks right here in our community who support KCTS 9. So we're deeply grateful to all of you for the support that you've provided to us. Um, as I mentioned, in late April, we announced a new strategic direction for KCTS. And change is always difficult. Change often comes with uh, you know, a little bit of, uh, of uh, frustration and challenge and sometimes misconceptions about what's actually taking place. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk a little bit about that. Um, we are really in the golden age of media, and, and, and maybe to define that a little more clearly, I should say we're in the latest of the golden ages of media because there have been many over history. And I would say that the disintermediation that has been taking place in media and technology has had a very profound effect on the way that consumers are relating to content and the way that we need to think about how a public television station will adapt in the future. So a lot of what I will walk through with you uh, this evening is a lot of stuff that you know about, particularly early on. These will be things that will be very familiar to you. I often talk to crowds that are a little bit less connected to media and technology than all of you are. And so uh, some of what you'll see in my presentation will be essentially kind of building a bit of a case, a case for why we're doing what we are doing. And so uh, I will walk you through some of that. Uh, this first slide is kind of a ridiculously simple view of what the media environment feels like today. It's very congested, right? There's an awful lot of new media players in there. This slide is probably old because there are players who have come and gone already, uh, and, uh, and yet there are people who are all fighting for the attention of the consumer uh, at, at, at a moment every single day. And so the challenge for a traditional media outlet, of course, is that organizations like these, new media companies, have completely upended the entire relationship that traditional media outlets have with consumers. It wasn't that many years ago that we really just watched a handful of radio stations or a handful of television stations, maybe a hometown newspaper or two, and that was sort of the media environment that we had access to, and that was just the way things were. And of course, what's different today is that every single one of us has the tools that we need to be our own media companies. Uh, so, so companies that you see featured here, of course, are all companies that are enabling each of us to uh, you know, uh, really create and distribute our own content 
in our own ways. And that explosion has really been all about enabling us to choose what we want, when we want it, where we want it, how we want it, and that's a, a, a theme that, of course, we're all well aware of. Uh, certainly all of you are aware of Periscope and Meerkat, but it's one of these uh, features that I talk about when I share things with groups. If you're not familiar with it, uh, you know, Periscope and Meerkat are apps that you can download on your Android or your iPhone device, and you can live stream or live broadcast, if you will, uh, any meeting or discussion that you happen to be a part of. And so it's an example, I use this example a lot because it's an example of how each one of us has the power in our palm to be a media company, to create our content, to distribute our content to our network uh, as we define it, or to, to send it out globally anywhere in the world, to take whatever we're experiencing and to turn that into content that might be of interest to somebody else. This is another example that probably a lot of you, particularly in the film community, are well aware of, and that has to do with the, the, the feature film Tangerine. It was one of the featured films at the Sundance Film Festival this year, and this film was shot entirely on an iPhone 5. And it was shot with technology that was developed right here uh, in Seattle. And, and so that's another demonstration of how each one of us, just with this device, uh, is a media company. And I don't know about all of you, but I get extremely anxious when I get very far from my iPhone because I'm wondering what I'm missing and what I'm not connected to or what I might see that I want to capture and distribute to somebody else. And so uh, we have become very wedded to uh, our tablets and our smartphones uh, for sure. And, and one last point I want to make about this is talking a little bit about uh, focus groups. And when you see focus groups, particularly when uh, organizations are, are looking at toddlers and technology, you have this very interesting dynamic that takes place and you'll see uh, that these toddlers or young children will go up to a television screen and the television will be turned off so it's just a blank screen sitting on a credenza sitting on a desk and they'll walk up to it and they'll try to they'll try to swipe it like it's an iPad and when it doesn't do anything they will turn to you and they'll say it's broken and it really kind of makes the point that if media is not interactive today it's broken so that's uh, one of the factors that, you know, uh, along with all of these other items that we started to really kind of digest and say, as someone who's responsible for the longevity of a public media entity, we have to do something about all of these dynamics that are sort of taking place in the environment around us and be responsive to that and not wait until that crisis comes along and faces us uh, and, and, and really think about those trends and those implications of those trends. So let me go back for just a moment and, um, and talk a little bit about the native effect. So my parents were radio natives. You know, they were born in an era where radio was just part of the environment. They never knew the world uh, without being able to sit around with mom and dad and listen to the radio. Here I am as a TV native. I come along, TV's been part of the environment uh, for a number of years, and I don't know the world without television. It's just always been part of the culture that uh, I, I know. And then we have the digital native. This is actually my daughter. She's 14 years old. She'd be horrified if she knew that I had her in this presentation. <laughs> Uh, but she's a digital native. She's 14. She doesn't know what it's like to not have immediate access to thousands of sources of content in the palm of her hand at a given moment in time. Any content she wants that's searchable, that's portable, that's on demand, it's all there for her in an instant. And she doesn't know what to do if she doesn't have that, except when we punish her and we take away all of her electronic devices, which we try to do, but it doesn't really work. My daughter doesn't watch TV. And she doesn't watch TV because she doesn't have to. She doesn't need to. She has plenty of access to lots of other things. How many people here have a TV? How many don't have a TV? Let me ask that. That's probably the better thing. So, okay. Uh, I, I, I talk to a lot of folks who say, you know, I don't even have a TV. Or I don't even watch TV. And you don't have to have one these days in order to experience a world of entertainment around you. And so that's a factor that we need to weigh as we're thinking about the strategy of a public media entity and where public television is going. The good news is, is that media and video consumption is skyrocketing. I and mean, people are consuming more and more media content today than ever before. So that's the great news. The other great news is that we live in a market that is really wired and really plugged in. Seattle is the number three city in the country for streaming video on demand. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, 
you know, we're at we're at near the top of the list in the in the U.S. And you can see we index well above the national average at about 50 percent. In tablet penetration, we're just a little bit above the national average. 51% of the marketplace has a tablet device of some type, uh, just a little bit ahead of uh, the norm. And on smartphones, about 81% penetration in the Seattle market, just a little bit ahead of the national norm there as well. So in all three of these areas, we're a bit of a connected city uh, to a larger degree uh, than many others in the United States. The interesting thing about smartphones is that about 30% of the usage on smartphones is attributed to video consumption. So more and more people are really using their smartphones to consume video. Now I think consumption on these devices tends to be opportunistic. You know, if you're on the bus or if you're at a Mariners game and you want to catch something at the seventh inning stretch, you have the ability to do that. It's not necessarily that lean back experience, but more and more as we live active lifestyles, we're looking for ways in which we can sort of fill the gaps with content that we get from our tablets and our smartphones and, and other types of devices. So the point really about all of this is that we no longer live in that era of media scarcity. That media scarcity that existed when I was a TV native and my parents were radio natives and there were just only a few channels and we could easily uh, understand and consume the channels of content that were around us. We don't live in that period anymore. It's a whole different ball game today. And I think as a, as a public media entity, we have to think a whole lot more about how we're going to adapt to that. One of the things uh, recently is the chief content officer of Netflix uh, made this statement about uh, their strategy around moving into children's programming. And it's an interesting statement because what he basically says, it's about building relationship. Because Netflix, you'd think, well, why are they investing so much money in developing children's programming? And what he says is how kids watch as they get older will be grounded in how they used to watch as children. And so Netflix is pouring a ton of energy into creating a lot of educational and kids content to start grooming that consumer. I mean, this is not a new model, right? McDonald's has been doing this for years, right? You get people in with Happy Meals and they become McDonald's consumers for life. And so it is about building relationships. It's about adapting to new behaviors and habits at an early age. And so we're sort of taking in all this information and looking at these pieces of data and saying, okay, what does all of this mean for us and how should we be adapting? And I promise I'll get to that in a second. Uh, take a look at this. Adults 18 to 24 uh, years old. This is weekly television viewership over the last four years. Okay, there's a 30% decline in 18 to 24 year old viewership in the last four years. Not surprising anecdotally, but interesting to see it when you actually look at it on screen and you see how much of an impact this is really making. So while video consumption and media content is skyrocketing, television viewership is declining. I was going to say plummeting, but that's maybe a little bit dramatic and I don't want to be a I don't want to be dramatic about it, but it is, it is happening. It's changing quite profoundly. So when we, in parallel, look at the age distribution of who's actually watching television, who's watching online content, who's consuming on smartphones, you see an interesting parallel here. Uh, younger audiences are migrating, of course, to online and mobile devices in fairly large numbers. And uh, it's interesting. A few years ago, there was a lot of talk, particularly in traditional media outlets, about second screen viewing. And of course, if you were in the television or the broadcasting business, you said, oh, there's a lot of second screen viewing going on. People are watching TV. And then they have these second screens, which are smartphones and tablets and other things. When in reality, the way things are today, people's primary screens are their smartphones and their tablets and their laptops. And television is on the back, in the background. So we are very much in a period here where television isn't dead by any stretch. It's still an incredibly powerful medium. But it is changing in some profound ways, and we obviously need to uh, find ways to adapt to it. I'll use this as an example. It, 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 when you think about the traditional means of producing television content, you think about creating a story. How much sense does it make for us to create a story and then hold on to that story for a week or several days maybe and tell all of you, okay, we're going to show this at 7 o'clock on Thursday nights and all of you need to schedule your lives around my production that I'm going to show you on my schedule. 
It just seems ridiculous when you sort of think about it in those terms. Now that doesn't mean, again, that, that, that lean back experience of television viewing is gone, but we have expectations that are very different today than they used to be. And so we have to figure out how are we going to live in both of those worlds as we think about how we evolve in the future. Now we'll get into some specific things here about, about KCTS. So take a look at this. Uh, I, and I apologize if this is a little uh, difficult to read, so I'll, I'll call out specific aspects of this that are important. What you see across the bottom of the screen are different demographics. So we have kids, two to five year olds, kids that are six to 11 year olds, kids that are 12 to 17, and then we get into adults 18 to 20, 21 to 24, et cetera, all the way up to 65 plus. Well, look at, look at this, 65 plus. This is the uh, makeup of the viewership of KCTS 9. So we have a little bit of a hammock going on. It's a very lopsided hammock, but it's a hammock, right? So we have a lot of kids audience between the ages of 2 and 11, about 21%. But boy, you can see they really age out of the kids' content by 11. They're sort of done. You know, a lot of the educational content we provide really doesn't appeal to them. That's not part of why they're there. And frankly, the, this day and age, they're in control of their media habit at that point, right? So they're now consuming a whole lot of stuff that's not necessarily linear television. Uh, the other end of the spectrum, of course, is this 55 plus audience where we have 57% uh, of our audience that's over the age of 55. So just when you look at the basic layout of the audience, and this is not unique to KCTS, this is very true for certainly public television. It's not that different actually for commercial television. Uh, although on the commercial side, there's far fewer viewers on the far younger end of the spectrum than we have because we actually cater to that marketplace. And they have a larger degree of audience in the 35 to 49 year old space than we tend to have. But it's a very interesting profile uh, when we start to think about who's actually watching television these days and who's watching public television. I think one of the challenges with this younger audience is that this is an audience that was born uh, between 2004 and 2013, okay? And so, again, as they gain control of their media usage, they are not likely to migrate into linear television as a primary medium as they get older. So the point we're making is that the past is not going to repeat itself. For me, as a young TV native who watched TV when I was a kid, I still watch a lot of TV as an adult you know, somewhat in the same fashion, although I watch very little live TV anymore. I pretty much record or DVR uh, almost everything. Um, but I don't think that the uh, presumption that we're making is that this audience on the younger end of the spectrum is not going to become heavy viewers of television like prior generations have. And so the past, in that sense, will not be repeating itself. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is if we do nothing, if we do nothing as a public television station or as a television broadcaster, where will we be in a decade? What will this profile look like? Now the numbers, statistically, the percentages may look very similar, but the real numbers, the real numbers of viewers will be significantly different and significantly smaller. The interesting thing to make note of in here as well is that the average age of our donor 67, 67 years old. And so that's great for bequests and planned giving. That usually gets a laugh, no? Okay. <laughs> that's people donating when they die, so it's in their will. So it's great for that. Um, Unfortunately, nobody lives forever, and so from a membership standpoint, as a membership-driven organization, we have to ask ourselves, if viewers are not going to fill the pipeline, frankly, as some of our older viewers exit the pipeline, what does that mean for our sustainability? How are we going to thrive and survive in the future if we are not grooming and developing new audiences um, as, as, uh, as we move forward? And so uh, that is the question that I think where will we be in the next decade or the next two decades if we do nothing? If we were to just ride this out, what's this going to look like for us? And so in our view, what it means is that if we don't redefine who we are, how we work, what our relationship is with our community, then we risk the very relevance of our organization uh, in the next 10 years. And, it, and, and as we know, technology has a way of picking up speed, right? So what has happened over the last five or 10 or 15 years will happen in even shorter periods of time in the next five or 10 or 15 years. 
So uh, a couple of other interesting things uh, to make note of, and I put this little uh, sample television schedule up here more for illustrative purposes than anything else, but if you were to look at a Monday through Friday schedule on KCTS 9 from 6 a.m. until 12 midnight, all this blue area, which on this screen looks a little bit white in places, uh, is PBS content or content that we acquire through syndicators like Acorn Media or the BBC. This little yellow slot is the local programming that we do. So 99.5% of our programming actually comes from another source outside of our market. We could be anywhere USA, PBS television station, and then we have this little bit of local content uh, that we produce. And again, this is the Thursday night at 7 o'clock time period where you can come in and get that great local content from KCTS. Um, so that's one issue uh, that I'll talk about on the content side. The second, the second item is the content cost. We spend an equal amount of money acquiring the 99.5% of our programming schedule as we spend producing the little yellow sliver you see there of 0.5%, the local production. Yeah, so when you think about that, you go, wow, really? Does that make sense? It costs us as much to acquire 99.5% of what we program as it costs us to produce the other half a percent. There's got to be a better way. This doesn't make sense. This is not sustainable. The other thing I'll make note of is that when we talk about how audiences are migrating to more streaming video devices, they're looking at content in different ways on different platforms, a lot of digital distribution, you know, we face a copyright issue. And the copyright issue is we don't own it. We don't own it on the 99.5% of the programming schedule that occupies our station and what drives a lot of people to watch what we do. Right? So if we don't own that and we don't have the ability to move that content into other environments, then we're becoming increasingly invisible to audiences as they get older, as audiences are passing away, as new audiences are filling our pipeline. We're just not there in the places where they are consuming content, where they're spending more and more of their time. So some of the national programs that you'll see from PBS are available on our website. But the interesting thing about that is it's, it's somewhat hit or miss. You know, you might find three or four episodes of Nature, but then you might only find them available for a couple of weeks. You might find some available for a month. It kind of all depends on what PBS is able to negotiate with the original content creator. And so it becomes a very bumpy experience if you think that you can go to kcts9.org and watch video from our station. You'll get some stuff, but you're maybe not going to find what you're actually looking for, and there's not a great deal of consistency in that experience, and that's a real challenge for us. The other aspect is it's not really exclusive to KCTS. I mean, they're out doing deals with Netflix and Hulu and Amazon and those guys, so you know, there's competition out there for that content. And the one issue that we face that many other PBS stations around the country don't face is that we have a huge amount of viewership up in British Columbia, and they're all geo-blocked from watching anything on our website because they're across the border, they're in Canada, they have a Canadian IP address, and they can't watch it because the rights have not been secured for Canada or for North America, they're only secured for the US. And so when we talk about ways in which the audience can actually interact with us on a digital sense and get some of their favorite programs on these digital platforms, it's not available to uh, the million plus viewers that I have up in British Columbia. And so that's a problem, that's, that's a real challenge for us. So without a robust digital presence, as I mentioned, we're becoming increasingly invisible in the online environment, and that was a factor of, of something that we really needed to address. Now I'm going to make a, a comment here about interstitials. This is the, we refer to the time between programs as interstitials. Uh, commercial stations would call it a commercial break, but we don't run commercials, technically. And so we have interstitial time, the time between shows that range anywhere from about a minute to upwards of 14 minutes, and that equals about two and a half hours of content a day. So I'm going to come back to this because it's a bit central to the strategy that we are adopting, but I want to plant this in the back of your mind so that when we get there, uh, we can talk a little bit about how we see interstitials becoming a factor in, uh, in our plan. Anybody have an idea what this number represents? What was that? Anybody? No, a year, 15 years ago. That's a good answer, though. No, 2,000 is the number of hours of on-air pledge that we run every year where we're asking for money. 
Okay, so if you do the 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you add all that up, it's almost one out of four hours. Okay, it's an amazing amount of time that we spend on your public television station asking you to support your public television station. So this is an issue. This is a big issue for us from a, a funding standpoint. It drives a lot of our funding, certainly. It's very important to what we do. Um, but when you have that much pledge programming or that much fundraising, it starts to become your brand. It starts to become what people remember about you. And that's one of the challenges. When I talk to people about KCTS, I say, you know, what do you think of when you think of KCTS? And, yeah, you get some Downton Abbey and you get some Big Bird and you always get pledge. You always get, you guys are always on there asking me for money. You're always begging for money. So that's an issue because that is not who we are. That's not what we should be remembered for. And frankly, it's not the value we should be delivering to our community. You know, the people watch KCTS 9 because we bring quality content to the marketplace of stories you wouldn't get anywhere else, right? And when so much of our brand starts to morph into this idea that we're on there asking for money about how not to, you know, how to do yoga in three easy steps, you know, you're really just an infomercial. You know, you're really just selling products so that you can raise enough money to operate as a station. So needless to say, we found a lot of these factors uh, that we were sort of thinking through uh, somewhat disturbing. And at the same time, uh, they offered us a ton of opportunity. So uh, we spent time as a team over the last uh, eight or 10 months or so really kind of thinking through, all right, let's put all this stuff into the mill and grind it around a little bit and figure out what are we going to do about this? How are we going to adapt uh, the way that we work? And so here's a little bit about what we're, what we're looking at. Now, uh, PBS has this campaign that's Be More, um, and so I thought I would just build on that uh, as, I, as we walk through uh, some of the steps of uh, how we're going to approach redefining public television and what we think is possible for us. So first of all, we have to be more than just public television. You know, I think that if we are exclusive to the public television sort of brand, uh, then we will risk our relevance over time. We have to think of ourselves as a public media entity. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit about our mission and a little bit about how we see uh, our insights into that mission and what our role is within that mission in just a moment. But one of the things we knew is that while TV is very, very important to us, if we are defined exclusively by the linear broadcast television platform, uh, then we would we would over time be very, very challenged uh, to really uh, build that relationship with the marketplace and with a new generation of public media consumers in a different way. So one of the things we're really doing is looking at thinking much larger than just public television. Public television is still important to us, all the great programs that people love about their public television station. Uh, but again, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to become invisible if we uh, focus exclusively on uh, the television environment. Uh, the second thing is we need to be more nimble. Um, you know, we have to create more smart, shareable local content, uh, leveraging all of the speed and all of the flexibility that is available in technology today. Traditional television uh, production methodologies are a goliath. I mean, they're, they're cumbersome, uh, they're capital intensive. And there's a much smarter, faster, leaner way for us to be creating content and to be uh, getting out into our community to do that. So uh, creating a more nimble internal uh, production method. This is one you'll find interesting because uh, we talk a lot about being more digital and, and, and sort of what does that mean. Uh, right now, this is sort of the workflow, if you will, for how content moves into our operation. So we have content coming from the network. We have content coming from this variety of syndicated sources where we just go out and buy uh, different content featured on the station. And then we have our local productions and they all feed into the TV station. And then particularly where the uh, content over here on local is concerned, we cut that up and we post it on our website. Or we post what content is available to us from PBS on our website. Okay, so that's kind of where we are today. And where we're saying we need to move is that we have to get far more aggressive about creating content and releasing it into the community right away. Getting it out there through digital and social networks. And we will move it, uh, make it backward compatible into the TV environment. But essentially what we're saying is that we need to start by creating great storytelling that we release into our community immediately, and then we'll move it onto the TV station later. But the TV station's kind of moving from kind of the front seat of our bus into the back seat of our bus, if you will. 
So the, uh, the other thing is we need to be where the stories are. We need to get outside the four walls of our station and we need to get out into the community where stories are taking place. We cover 400,000 square miles of the Pacific Northwest, all through British Columbia, all through Western Washington, all through Central Washington. And this is the thing I'm most excited about being here is because there are so many incredible content creators in our community and we want to find a way and a framework to sort of open up the doors and say let's bring content into this environment where we can help fund and support content creation because it isn't all about us sitting in our cubicles at 5th and, and Mercer and creating you know, story ideas and then going out and shooting those things. It's about bringing the creative community into that process. And so that's very much a part of what we want to do is sort of get outside and start putting money where the stories are and getting money in the hands of content creators that can bring great storytelling to KCTS. Uh, being a community builder, uh, we think there's an interesting opportunity here between sort of, if you think about a spectrum of media, at one end of the spectrum there's sort of corporate media, which I would put PBS in that category. It's kind of catered, spoon-fed content where it's sort of you sit back and it's just you consume it, it's what's being fed to you, and that's the way it goes. And then at the other end of the spectrum you have you know, all the enabling technologies, YouTube and Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram and all the things that are making each and every one of us our own media companies today. But somewhere in between is this interesting idea about sort of bringing the community together to drive uh, a higher level of storytelling uh, from real people in our community. That's uh, some of the work that TED is doing. StoryCorps does that. Moth Radio Hour does a great job of that in terms of saying, hey, you've got a really great story to tell. Let us work with you to help craft that story because it's your story. It's your authentic and unique story, but maybe we can be helpful in bringing some educational resources, some tools that will help you tell that story in a unique way, and then we bring that story to the community. So it's kind of an educational initiative that we have in mind, and we're excited to sort of pursue that. We haven't started to build the framework for it, but uh, it's something we're really excited to be a part of. Um, we need to be more flexible. We have to really sort of release ourselves from time and space. And what that really means is that if a story takes two minutes to tell or it takes 42 minutes to tell, we should be telling that story. And right now, the way the traditional television environment works is if I can't make it fit into my 30-minute window or it doesn't fit my theme for that week, then yeah, that story might not get told at all. And I think what we need to do is think about how the digital platforms can be used to actually tell great stories. And if that story doesn't fit a conventional broadcast distribution model, that's fine. We'll distribute it out through other uh, other methodologies. There's tons of them out there, as we all know. Uh, but if we can make it work on broadcast, then we want to give that exposure uh, to that content as well. So it's really about bringing freedom from time and space and allowing stories to be distributed immediately and then building conversations around those stories through social media and other, other strategies of that nature. So let me go back to this slide. We have our programming schedule. We've got our little yellow window there where we do some local content today. And so if we're going to be more local, how are we going to do that? Um, so one of the ways that we see doing that is that we're going to go back to those interstitial uh, uh, breaks that I mentioned, those 1 to 14 minute breaks uh, between programs. And we've got a bunch of those all day long, every single day. And so rather than us having a, an environment on KCTS where you've got this one window that you have to schedule your life around in order to see our local content or set your DVR, uh, we want to move to an environment where we're using those interstitial times to bring that, those local stories into our station all day, every day. So that when you're watching KCTS, if you're watching a great Frontline episode or PBS NewsHour, we're going to wrap around some great civic and social uh, programming into the breaks immediately before and after a great program like that. Or if we want to talk about arts and culture, we're going to bring that into uh, an Austin City Limits or a Live from Lincoln Center. So we can tailor a lot of the great local storytelling uh, and bring it onto the TV environment in places where our audience is already there watching some of their favorite PBS content. But most importantly, that content will be out in the community already because it's been produced, it's been distributed, it's already out there. We've built conversations and social around it. Again, this is for those who really love that Lean Back TV uh, experience. And finally, of course, we have to diversify ourselves. Uh, we we uh, are largely based on membership. This is a revenue pie for the station. Uh, you see that membership really drives our organization. We love that. 
But we also know that if we aren't thinking about membership in new and different ways, that's going to be challenging in the future. And so we have to look at ways in which we can diversify ourselves. We do receive funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. It's about 9% or so of our total revenue. So most of the revenue we generate, again, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, either from individuals uh, locally here through membership and major giving or from businesses in the corporate underwriting environment. Uh, but we know that uh, while we don't have every business model uh, worked out with respect to how digital sort of factor into our model, we know that we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, in this environment. So as I wrap up, um, you know, I think we, we live in a really dynamic time, of course, for media, as all of you know. Um, I think we're very fortunate to be in a marketplace where uh, independent public media is really highly valued, and that's not the case in every city across the United States, so we are uh, fortunate in that regard. And of course, we're in an environment where we have an incredible creative community, incredible technical community uh, that makes the directions that we're headed uh, really very, very possible. So. I think one of the things that we are uh, most interested in being able to do is really open the doors, bring the creative community much more involved in what we're doing so that we can really put public, this will, this will sound really corny and slogany, but put the public really back in public media and get the public more actively involved because we're all content creators today and we all have the ability uh, to contribute some really great ideas. And, uh, and we believe that over the long term that will really help us uh, be much more nimble and much more sustainable. So our mission is to inspire a smarter world. So, and, and we believe strongly that the foundation of our content has to be about creating really thoughtful and smart and shareable content for our community. But we need to be a whole lot more local. And we need to be local on the television station, certainly, but we can have a much bigger impact by connecting with audiences through digital and social networks. And that's really where, as an organization, we're looking to place uh, our primary resources. So. Um, that's a snapshot of where we're headed. Um, I hope this has been helpful. I'm really interested to get your feedback and questions, so I'll hang out afterwards and answer questions. Uh, and thanks very much for being here. I really appreciate it. One of the reasons why I was one of the reasons I was so inspired to have Rob come is because he has a deep appreciation and love for storytelling. And everyone in this room is a storyteller. And that's what, that's what ins inspires me and the work that we do at Filmworks. And clearly, there's a new vision. So thank you once again to Rob. And he'll be around for questions afterwards. If anyone wants to just grab a business card, I brought a stack of them. So if you just want to grab one and catch up with me later, that's great too. So.